2. Seeing Together For several weeks after my return to Los Angeles I had a sense of mild discomfort which I explained away as a dizziness or a sudden loss of breath due to physical exertion. It reached a climax one night when I woke up terrified, unable to breathe. The physician I went to see diagnosed my trouble as hyperventilation, most likely caused by tension. He prescribed a tranquilizer and suggested breathing into a paper bag if the attack should ever occur again. I decided to return to Mexico to seek La Gorda's counsel. After I had told her the doctor's diagnosis, she calmly assured me that no illness was involved, that I was finally losing my shields, and that what I was experiencing was the loss of my human form and the entrance into a new state of separation from human affairs. Don't fight it she said. Our natural reaction is to struggle against it. In doing so we dispel it. Let go of your fear and follow the loss of your human form step by step. She added that in her case the disintegration of her human form began in her womb, with a severe pain and an inordinate pressure that shifted slowly in two directions, down her legs and up to her throat. She also said that the effects are felt immediately. I wanted to record every nuance of my entrance into that new state. I prepared myself to write down a detailed account of whatever took place, but to my utter chagrin nothing more happened. After a few days of fruitless expectation I gave up on La Gorda's explanation and concluded that the doctor had correctly diagnosed my condition. It was perfectly understandable to me. I was carrying a responsibility that generated unbearable tension. I had accepted the leadership that the apprentices believed belonged to me, but I had no idea how to lead. The pressure in my life also showed in a more serious way. My usual level of energy was dropping steadily. Don Juan would have said that I was losing my personal power and that eventually I would lose my life. Don Juan had set me up to live exclusively by means of personal power, which I understood to be a state of being a relationship of order between the subject and the universe, a relationship that cannot be disrupted without resulting in the subject's death. Since there was no foreseeable way to change my situation, I had concluded that my life was coming to an end. My feeling of being doomed seemed to infuriate all the apprentices. I decided to get away from them for a couple of days to dispel my gloom and their tension. When I came back I found them standing outside the front door of the little sister's house as if they had been waiting for me. Nestor ran to my car and before I even turned the motor off he blurted out that Pablito had run away. He had gone to die, Nestor said, in the city of Tula, the place of his ancestors. I was appalled. I felt guilty. La Gorda did not share my concern. She was beaming, exuding contentment. That little pimp is better off dead, she said. All of us are going to live together harmoniously now, as we should. The Nagwell told us that you were going to bring change into our lives. Well, you did. Pablito is not bugging us any longer. You got rid of him. Look how happy we are. We are better off without him. I was outraged by her callousness. I stated as forcefully as I could that Don Juan had given all of us in a most painstaking manner, the format of a warrior's life. I stressed that the warrior's impeccability demanded that I not let Pablito die just like that. And what do you think you're going to do? La Gorda asked. I'm going to take one of you to live with him, I said, until the day when all of you, including Pablito, can move out of here. They laughed at me, even Nestor and Benigno who I thought were closest to Pablito. La Gorda laughed longer than anyone else, obviously challenging me. I turned to Nestor and Benigno for moral support. They looked away. I appealed to La Gorda's superior understanding. I pleaded with her. I used all the arguments I could think of. She looked at me with utter contempt. Let's get going, she said to the others. She gave me the most vacuous smile. She shrugged her shoulders and made a vague puckering gesture with her lips. You're welcome to come with us, she said to me, providing that you don't ask questions or talk about that little pimp. You are a formless warrior, Gorda, I said. 
You told me that yourself. Why, then, do you judge Pablito? La Gorda did not answer. But she acknowledged the blow. She frowned and avoided my gaze. La Gorda is with us. Josefina yelled in a high-pitched voice. The three little sisters gathered around La Gorda and pulled her inside the house. I followed them. Nestor and Benigno also went inside. What are you going to do, take one of us by force? La Gorda asked me. I told all of them that I considered it my duty to help Pablito and that I would do the same for any one of them. You really think you can pull this off? La Gorda asked me, her eyes flaring with anger. I wanted to roar with rage as I had once done in their presence, but the circumstances were different. I could not do it. I'm going to take Josefina with me, I said. I am the Nagual. La Gorda gathered the three little sisters and shielded them with her body. They were about to join hands. Something in me knew that if they did, their combined strength would have been awesome and my efforts to take Josefina would have been useless. My only chance was to strike before they had a chance to group. I pushed Josefina with the palms of my hands and sent her reeling to the center of the room. Before they had time to regroup themselves, I hit Lydia and Rosa. They bent over with pain. La Gorda came at me with a fury I had never witnessed in her. It was like the attack of a savage beast. Her whole concentration was on a single thrust of her body. If she had struck me, I would have been killed. She missed my chest by inches. I grabbed her from behind in a bear hug and we tumbled down. We rolled over and over until we were utterly exhausted. Her body relaxed. She began to caress the back of my hands, which were tightly clasped around her stomach. I noticed then that Nestor and Benigno were standing by the door. They both seemed to be on the verge of becoming physically ill. La Gorda smiled shyly and whispered in my ear that she was glad I had overcome her. I took Josefina to Pablito. I felt that she was the only one of the apprentices who genuinely needed someone to look after her and Pablito resented her the least. I was sure that his sense of chivalry would force him to reach out to her since she would be in need of help. A month later I returned once more to Mexico. Pablito and Josefina had returned. They were living together at Don G. E. Naro's house and shared it with Benigno and Rosa. Nestor and Lydia lived at Soledad's place and La Gorda lived alone in the little sister's house. Do our new living arrangements surprise you? La Gorda asked. My surprise was more than evident. I wanted to know all the implications of this new organization. La Gorda let me know in a dry tone that there were no implications that she knew of. They had chosen to live in couples but not as couples. She added that, contrary to what I might think, they were impeccable warriors. The new format was rather pleasant. Everybody seemed to be completely relaxed. There was no more bickering or outbursts of competitive behavior among them. They had also taken to dressing in the Indian apparel typical of that region. The women wore dresses with full gathered skirts that almost touched the ground. They wore dark shawls and their hair in braids, except for Josefina, who always wore a hat. The men wore thin, white pajama-like pants and shirts, and straw hats. All of them wore homemade sandals. I asked La Gorda the reason for their new way of dressing. She said that they were getting ready to leave. Sooner or later, with my help or by themselves, they were going to leave that valley. They would be going into a new world, a new life. When they did that they would acknowledge the change, the longer they wore their Indian clothes the more drastic the change would be when they put on city clothes. She added that they had been taught to be fluid, at ease in whatever situation they found themselves, and that I had been taught the same. My challenge was to deal with them with these regardless of what they did to me. Their challenge in turn was to leave their valley and settle down elsewhere to find out if they could be as fluid as warriors should be. I asked for her honest opinion about our chances of succeeding. She said that failure was written all over our faces. La Gorda changed the subject abruptly and told me that in her dreaming she had found herself staring at a gigantic narrow gorge between two enormous round mountains, she thought that the two mountains were familiar to her, 
and wanted me to drive her to a nearby town. She believed, without knowing why, that the two mountains were located there, and that the message from her dreaming was that both of us should go there. We left at the crack of dawn. I had driven through that town before. It was very small and I had never noticed anything in its surroundings that even came close to Lagorda's vision. There were only eroded hills around it. It turned out that the two mountains were not there, or if they were, we could not find them. During the two hours that we spent in that town, however, both of us had a feeling that we knew something undefined, a feeling which turned at times into a certainty and then receded again into the darkness to become merely annoyance and frustration. Visiting that town unsettled us in mysterious ways, or rather, for unknown reasons we became very agitated. I was in the throes of a most illogical conflict. I did not remember having ever stopped in that town, and yet I could have sworn that I had not only been there, but had lived there for a time. It was not a clear memory, I did not remember the streets or the houses. What I felt was a vague but strong apprehension that something was going to become clear in my mind. I was not sure what, a memory perhaps. At moments that vague apprehension became paramount, especially when I saw a particular house. I parked in front of it. La Gorda and I looked at it from the car for perhaps an hour, yet neither of us suggested leaving the car to go into it. Both of us were very edgy. We began to talk about her vision of the two mountains, our conversation soon turned into an argument. She thought I had not taken her dreaming seriously. Our tempers flared and we ended up yelling at each other, not so much out of anger as out of nervousness. I caught myself and stopped. On our way back, I parked the car on the side of the dirt road. We got out to stretch our legs. We walked for a while, it was too windy to enjoy it. La Gorda still seemed to be agitated. We went back to the car and sat inside. If you would only rally your knowledge, La Gorda said in a pleading tone. You would know that losing the human form. She stopped in mid-sentence, my frown must have brought her up short. She was cognizant of my struggle. If there was any knowledge in me that I could have consciously rallied, I would have done it already. But we are luminous beings, she said in the same pleading tone. There is so much more to us. You are the Nagual. There is even more to you. What do you think I should do? I asked. You must let go of your desire to cling, she said. The very same thing happened to me. I held on to things, such as the food I liked, the mountains where I lived, the people I used to enjoy talking to. But most of all I clung to the desire to be liked. I told her that her advice was meaningless to me, for I was not aware of holding on to anything. She insisted that somehow I knew that I was putting up barriers to losing my human form. Our attention is drained to focus doggedly, she went on. That is the way we maintain the world. Your first attention has been taught to focus on something that's quite strange to me, but very familiar to you. I told her that my mind dwells on abstractions, not abstractions like mathematics, for instance, but rather propositions of reasonableness. Now is the time to let go of all that, she said. In order to lose your human form you should let go of all that ballast. You counterbalance so hard that you paralyze yourself. I was in no mood to argue. What she called losing the human form was a concept too vague for immediate consideration. I was concerned with what we had experienced in that town. La Gorda did not want to talk about it. The only thing that counts is that you rally your knowledge, she said. You can do it if you need to, like that day when Pablito ran away and you and I came to blows. La Gorda said that what had happened on that day was an example of rallying one's knowledge. Without being thoroughly aware of what I was doing, I had performed complex maneuvers which required seeing. You did not just attack us, she said. You saw. She was right in a manner of speaking. Something quite out of the ordinary had taken place on that occasion. I had considered it in great detail, confining it, however, to purely personal speculation. I had no adequate explanation for it, outside of saying that the emotional charge of the moment had affected me in inconceivable ways. 
When I stepped inside their house and faced the four women I became aware in one split second that I was able to shift my ordinary way of perceiving. I saw four amorphous blobs of very intense amber light in front of me. One of them was more mellow, more pleasing. The other three were unfriendly, sharp, whitish amber glows. The mellow glow was La Gorda. And at that moment the three unfriendly glows were looming menacingly over her. The blob of whitish luminosity closest to me, which was Josefina, was a bit off balance. It was leaning over, so I gave it a push. I kicked the other two in a depression they each had on their right side. I had no conscious idea that I should kick them there. I simply found the indentation convenient, somehow it invited me to put my foot in it. The result was devastating. Lydia and Rosa fainted on the spot. I had kicked each of them on their right thigh. It was not a kick that could have broken any bones, I only pushed the blobs of light in front of me with my foot. Nonetheless, it was as if I had given them a ferocious blow in the most vulnerable part of their bodies. La Gorda was right, I had rallied some knowledge I was not aware of. If that was called seeing, the logical conclusion for my intellect would be to say that seeing is a bodily knowledge. The predominance of the visual sense in us influences this bodily knowledge and makes it seem to be eye-related. What I experienced was not altogether visual. I saw the blobs of light with something else besides my eyes, since I was conscious that the four women were in my field of vision during the entire time I dealt with them. The blobs of light were not even superimposed on them. The two sets of images were separate. What complicated the issue for me was the matter of time. Everything was compressed into a few seconds. If I did shift from one scene to the other, the shift must have been so fast that it became meaningless, thus I can only recall perceiving two separate scenes simultaneously. After I had kicked the two blobs of light, the mellow one La Gorda, came toward me. It did not come straight at me, but angled to my left from the moment it started to move, it obviously intended to miss me, so when the glow passed by I grabbed it. As I rolled over and over on the floor with it, I felt I was melting into it. That was the only time I really lost the sense of continuity. I again became aware of myself while La Gorda was caressing the backs of my hands. In our dreaming, the little sisters and I have learned to join hands, La Gorda said. We know how to make a line. Our problem that day was that we had never made that line outside our room. That was why they dragged me inside. Your body knew what it meant for us to join hands. If we had done it, I would have been under their control. They are more fierce than I am. Their bodies are tightly sealed, they are not concerned with sex. I am. That makes me weaker. I'm sure that your concern with sex is what makes it very difficult for you to rally your knowledge. She went on talking about the debilitating effects of having sex. I felt ill at ease. I tried to steer the conversation away from that topic but she seemed determined to go back to it regardless of my discomfort. Let's you and I drive to Mexico City, I said in desperation. I thought I would shock her. She did not answer. She puckered her lips, squinting her eyes. She contracted the muscles of her chin, pushing her upper lip until it bulged under her nose. Her face became so contorted that I was taken aback. She reacted to my surprise and relaxed her facial muscles. Come on, Gorda, I said. Let's go to Mexico City. Sure. Why not? She said. What do I need? I did not expect that reaction and ended up shocked myself. Nothing, I said. We'll go as we are. Without saying another word, she slumped on the seat and we drove off toward Mexico City. It was still early, not even midday. I asked her if she would dare to go to Los Angeles with me. She was pensive for a moment. I've just asked my luminous body that question, she said. What did it say? It said only if power permits it. There was such a wealth of feeling in her voice that I stopped the car and hugged her. My affection for her at that moment was so deep that I got frightened. It had nothing to do with sex or the need of psychological reinforcement. It was a feeling that transcended everything I knew. 
Embracing Lagorda brought back the sense I had had earlier, that something in me which was bottled up, pushed into recesses I could not consciously reach, was about to come out. I almost knew then what it was, but I lost it when I reached for it. La Gorda and I arrived in the city of Oaxaca in the early evening. I parked my car on a side street and then we walked to the center of town, to the plaza. We looked for the bench where Don Juan and Don Jenna Uro used to sit. It was unoccupied. We sat there in reverent silence. Finally La Gorda said that she had been there with Don Juan many times as well as with someone else she could not remember. She was not sure whether that was something she had merely dreamed. What did you do with Don Juan on this bench? I asked. Nothing. We just sat waiting for the bus, or for the lumber truck that would give us a ride up the mountains, she replied. I told her that when I sat on that bench with Don Juan we would talk for hours. I recounted for her the great predilection that he had for poetry, and how I used to read it to him when we had nothing else to do. He would listen to poems on the premise that only the first or sometimes the second stanza was worthwhile reading, the rest he found to be indulgence on the poet's part. There were very few poems, of the hundreds I must have read to him, that he listened to all the way through. At first I read to him what I liked, my preference was for abstract convoluted, cerebral poetry. Later he made me read over and over what he liked. In his opinion a poem had to be compact, preferably short. And it had to be made up of precise poignant images of great simplicity. In the late afternoon, sitting on that bench in Oaxaca, a poem by Caesar Vallejo always seemed to sum up for him a special feeling of longing. I recited it to La Gorda from memory, not so much for her benefit as for mine. I wonder what she is doing at this hour. My Andean and sweet Rita. Of reeds and wild cherry trees. Now that this weariness chokes me, and blood dozes off. Like lazy brandy inside me. I wonder what she is doing with those hands. That in attitude of penitence. Used to iron starchy whiteness. In the afternoons. Now that this rain is taking away my desire to go on. I wonder what has become of her skirt with lace. Of her toils, of her walk. Of her scent of spring sugar cane from that place. She must be at the door. Gazing at a fast moving cloud. A wild bird on the tile roof will let out a call. And shivering she will say at last, Jesus, it's cold. The memory of Don Juan was incredibly vivid. It was not a memory on the level of my thought, nor was it on the level of my conscious feelings. It was an unknown kind of memory that made me weep. Tears were streaming from my eyes, but they were not soothing at all. The last hour of the afternoon had always had special significance for Don Juan. I had accepted his regard for that hour, and his conviction that if something of importance were to come to me, it would have to be at that time. La Gorda put her head on my shoulder. I rested my head on her head. We remained in that position for a while. I felt relaxed, the agitation had been driven away from me. It was strange that the single act of resting my head on La Gorda's would bring such peace. I wanted to make a joke and tell her that we should tie our heads together. Then I knew that she would actually take me up on that. My body shook with laughter and I realized that I was asleep. Yet my eyes were open, if I had really wanted to, I could have stood up. I did not want to move, so I remained there fully awake and yet asleep. I saw people walking by and staring at us. I did not mind that in the least. Ordinarily I would have objected to being noticed. Then all at once the people in front of me changed into very large blobs of white light. I was facing the luminous eggs in a sustained fashion for the first time in my life. Don Juan had told me that human beings appear to the seer as luminous eggs. I had experienced flashes of that perception, but never before had I focused my vision on them as I was doing that day. The blobs of light were quite amorphous at first. It was as if my eyes were not properly focused. But then, at one moment, it was as if I had finally arranged my vision and the blobs of white light became oblong luminous eggs. They were big. In fact, they were enormous, 
perhaps 7 feet high by 4 feet wide or even larger. At one moment I noticed that the eggs were no longer moving. I saw a solid mass of luminosity in front of me. The eggs were watching me, looming dangerously over me. I moved deliberately and sat up straight. La Gorda was sound asleep on my shoulder. There was a group of adolescents around us. They must have thought that we were drunk. They were mimicking us. The most daring adolescent was feeling La Gorda's breasts. I shook her and woke her up. We stood up in a hurry and left. They followed us, taunting us and yelling obscenities. The presence of a policeman on the corner dissuaded them from continuing with their harassment. We walked in complete silence from the plaza to where I had left my car. It was almost evening. Suddenly La Gorda grabbed my arm. Her eyes were wild, her mouth open. She pointed. Look! Look! She yelled. There's the Nagual and Jenna Uro. I saw two men turning the corner a long block ahead of us. La Gorda took off in a fast run. Running after her, I asked her if she was sure. She was beside herself. She said that when she had looked up, both Don Juan and Don Jenna Uro were staring at her. The moment her eyes met theirs they moved away. When we reached the corner ourselves, the two men were still the same distance away from us. I could not distinguish their features. They were dressed like rural Mexican men. They were wearing straw hats. One was husky, like Don Juan, the other was thin, like Don Jenna Uro. The two men went around another corner and we again ran noisily after them. The street they had turned onto was deserted and led to the outskirts of town. It curved slightly to the left. The two men were just where the street curved. Right then something happened that made me feel it was possible they might really be Don Juan and Don Jenna Uro. It was a movement that the smaller man made. He turned three-quarter profile to us and tilted his head as if telling us to follow, something Don Jenna Uro used to do to me whenever we were out in the woods. He always walked ahead of me, daring, coaxing me with a movement of his head to catch up with him. La Gorda began to yell at the top of her voice. Nagual. Jenna Uro. Wait. She ran ahead of me. They were walking very fast towards some shacks that were half visible in the semi-darkness. They must have entered one of them or turned into any of a number of pathways, suddenly they were out of sight. La Gorda stood there and bellowed their names without any bashfulness. People came out to see who was yelling. I held her until she calmed down. They were right in front of me, she said, crying. Not even ten feet away. When I yelled and called your attention to them they were a block away in one instant. I tried to appease her. She was in a high state of nervousness. She clung to me shivering. For some indiscernible reason I was absolutely sure that the two men were not Don Juan and Don Jenna Uro, therefore, I could not share La Gorda's agitation. She said that we had to drive back home, that power would not permit her to go to Los Angeles or even to Mexico City with me. It was not time yet for her journey. She was convinced that seeing them had been an omen. They had disappeared pointing toward the east, toward her hometown. I did not have any objections to starting back that very moment. After all the things that had happened to us that day I should have been dead tired. Instead I was vibrating with the most extravagant vigor, reminiscent of times with Don Juan when I had felt like ramming walls with my shoulders. On our way back to my car I was again filled with the most passionate affection for La Gorda. I could never thank her enough for her help. I thought that whatever she had done to help me see the luminous eggs had worked. She had been so courageous, risking ridicule and even bodily harm by sitting on that bench. I expressed my thanks to her. She looked at me as if I were crazy and then broke into a belly laugh. I thought the same thing about you, she said. I thought you had done it just for me. I too saw luminous eggs. This was the first time for me also. We have seen together like the Nagual and Jenna Uro used to do. As I opened the door of the car for La Gorda, the full impact of what we had done struck me. Up to that point I had been numb, something in me had slowed down. Now my euphoria was as intense as La Gorda's agitation had been a short while before. 
I wanted to run in the street and shout. It was La Gorda's turn to contain me. She squatted and rubbed my calves. Strangely enough, I calmed down immediately. I found that it was difficult for me to talk. My thoughts were running ahead of my ability to verbalize them. I did not want to drive back to her hometown right away. There seemed to be still so much more to do. Since I could not explain clearly what I wanted, I practically dragged a reluctant Gorda back to the plaza, but there were no empty benches at that hour. I was famished so I pulled her into a restaurant. She thought she could not eat but when they brought the food she turned out to be as hungry as I was. Eating relaxed us completely. We sat on the bench later that night. I had refrained from talking about what happened to us until we had a chance to sit there. La Gorda was at first unwilling to say anything. My mind was in a peculiar state of exhilaration. I had had similar moments with Don Juan, but associated, as a rule, with the after-effects of hallucinogenic plants. I began by describing to La Gorda what I had seen. The feature of those luminous eggs that had impressed me the most was their movements. They did not walk. They moved in a floating manner, yet they were grounded. The way they moved was not pleasing. Their movements were stilted, wooden, and jerky. When they were in motion the whole egg shape became smaller and rounder, they seemed to jump or jerk, or shake up and down with great speed. The result was a most annoying nervous shivering. Perhaps the closest I can get to describing the physical discomfort caused by their motion would be to say that I felt as if the images on a moving picture screen had been speeded up. Another thing that had intrigued me was that I could not detect any legs. I had once seen a ballet production in which the dancers mimicked the movement of soldiers on ice skates, for that effect they wore loose tunics that hung all the way to the floor. There was no way to see their feet, thus the illusion that they were gliding on ice. The luminous eggs that paraded in front of me gave the impression that they were sliding on a rough surface. Their luminosity shook up and down almost imperceptibly, yet enough to make me nearly ill. When the eggs were in repose they became elongated. Some of them were so long and rigid that they brought to mind the idea of a wooden icon. Another even more disturbing feature of the luminous eggs was the absence of eyes. I had never realized so acutely how we are drawn to the eyes of living beings. The luminous eggs were thoroughly alive, they were observing me with great curiosity. I could see them jerking up and down, leaning over to watch me, but without any eyes. Many of those luminous eggs had black spots on them, huge spots below the midsection. Others did not. La Gorda had told me that reproduction affects the bodies of both men and women by causing a hole to appear below the stomach but the spots on those luminous eggs did not seem like holes to me. They were areas with no luminosity, but there was no depth to them. Those that had the black spots seemed to be mellow, tired, the crest of their egg shape was wilted, it looked opaque in comparison to the rest of their glow. The ones without spots, on the other hand, were dazzlingly bright. I fancied them to be dangerous. They were vibrant, filled with energy and whiteness. La Gorda said that the instant I rested my head on her she also entered into a state that resembled dreaming. She was awake, yet she could not move. She was conscious that people were milling around us. Then she saw them turning into luminous blobs and finally into egg-shaped creatures. She did not know that I was also seeing. She had thought at first that I was watching over her. But at one moment the pressure of my head was so heavy that she concluded quite consciously that I too must have been seeing. Only after I straightened up and caught the young man fondling her as she seemed to sleep did I have an inkling of what might be happening to her. Our visions differed in that she could distinguish men from women by the shape of some filaments that she called roots. Women, she said, had thick bundles of filaments that resembled a lion's tail. They grew inward from the place of the genitalia. She explained that those roots were the givers of life. The embryo, in order to accomplish its growth, attaches itself to one of those nurturing routes and thoroughly consumes it, leaving only a hole. Men, on the other hand, had short filaments that were alive and floating almost separately from the luminous mass of their bodies. 
I asked her what in her opinion was the reason we had seen together. She declined to make any comment, but she coaxed me to go ahead with my speculations. I told her that the only thing that occurred to me was the obvious, emotions must have been a factor. After La Gorda and I had sat down on Don Juan's favorite bench in the late afternoon that day, and I had recited the poem that he liked, I was highly charged with emotion. My emotions must have prepared my body. But I also had to consider the fact that from doing dreaming I had learned to enter into a state, of total quietness. I was able to turn off my internal dialogue and remain as if I were inside a cocoon, peeking out of a hole. In that state I could either let go of some control I had and enter into dreaming, or I could hold on to that control and remain passive, thoughtless, and without desires. I did not think, however, that those were the significant factors. I believe the catalyst was La Gorda. I thought it was what I felt for her which had created the conditions for seeing. La Gorda laughed shyly when I told her what I believed. I don't agree with you, she said. I think what has happened is that your body has started to remember. What do you mean by that, Gorda? I asked. There was a long pause. She seemed to be either fighting to say something she did not want to say, or she was desperately trying to find the appropriate word. There are so many things that I know, she said, and yet I don't know what I know. I remember so many things that I finally end up remembering nothing. I think you are in the same predicament yourself. I assured her that I was not aware of it. She refused to believe me. At times I really believe you don't know, she said. At other times I believe you are playing with us. The Nagual told me that he himself didn't know. A lot of things that he told me about you are coming back to me now. What does it mean that my body has begun to remember? I insisted. Don't ask me that, she said with a smile. I don't know what you are supposed to remember, or what that remembering is like. I've never done it, myself. I know that much. Is there anybody among the apprentices who could tell me? I asked. No one, she said. I think I'm a courier to you, a courier who can bring you only half a message this time. She stood up and begged me to drive her back to her hometown. I was too exhilarated to leave then. We walked around the plaza at my suggestion. Finally we sat down on another bench. Isn't it strange to you that we could see together with such ease? La Gorda asked. I did not know what she had in mind. I was hesitant in answering. What would you say if I told you that I think we've seen together before? La Gorda asked, carefully voicing her words. I could not understand what she meant. She repeated the question one more time and I still could not get her meaning. When could we have seen together before? I asked. Your question doesn't make sense. That's the point, she replied. It doesn't make sense, and yet I have the feeling we have seen together before. I felt a chill and stood up. I remembered again the sensation I had had in that town. La Gorda opened her mouth to say something but stopped herself in mid-sentence. She stared at me, bewildered, put her hand to my lips, and then practically dragged me to the car. I drove all night. I wanted to talk, to analyze, but she fell asleep as if purposely avoiding any discussion. She was right, of course. Of the two of us. She was the one who was cognizant of the danger of dissipating a mood through overanalyzing seeing it. As she got out of the car, when we arrived at her house, she said that we could not talk at all about what happened to us in Oxica. Why is that, Gorda? I asked. I don't want to waste our power, she said. That's the sorcerer's way. Never waste your gains. But if we don't talk about it, we'll never know what really happened to us. I protested. We have to keep quiet for at least nine days, she said. Can we talk about it, just between the two of us? I asked. A talk between the two of us is precisely what we must avoid, she said. We're vulnerable. We must allow ourselves time to heal, 